Hi, I'm Dennis Weiss. I work for Eagle Communications. I have my friends William Snyder, Troy Elkins, and we are presenting Why Like Ike to you today. And for those of you who are Western fans, you'll be ecstatic <laughs> to find out that Dwight David Eisenhower was as well. Yes, he was. Well known for his love of all things Western. We have a beautiful picture behind us that I adore, and I ask, whose is it? And we didn't really know who did the painting, but the horses are just right in it. I just, especially the white shot. horse right there that's sliding to a stop in front of the down mule. Now that is well done. <laughs> just glad you like one it. of my things, you see. So, okay, Troy, we can't help but notice you got a little set of horns in front of us. You're the <laughs> artifact guy today, so holy mackerel. Well, this is a set, of course, of horns from a Texas Longhorn, mm -hmm. which were the, um, basically, it was a hybrid breed that uh, was originally brought over by the Spanish and let loose wild into Texas. Eventually, it uh, breeded, crossbreeded with uh, various other breeds of cattle and made its own unique uh, cow. You know, another way of saying that? It crossbred with anything it wanted to. <laughs> uh, the, they were very wild. In fact, you read several of the cowboy stories about rounding them up and wow. tracking them, especially in the Mesquite of Texas. It would, they would say it was easier to track antelope than it was to, yeah. to round up longhorns. Yeah. You and, know, uh, w we said at the end of the Chisholm Trail, uh, Abilene as a community, we had a festival last year, 2017, the actual 150th year, William. That's right. And it's going to be a big thing and it's huge to our community. So this is our way with Why Like Ike to, again, show the relevance of Dwight <laughs> David Eisenhower and con especially connected to things mm -hmm. of Abilene. Mm -hmm. He grew up here Mm -hmm. And these things were the first large economic venture mm -hmm. in Abilene. That's right. Uh, Joseph McCoy was an entrepreneur from Illinois. Uh, interesting side note, he was actually a boyhood friend of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Illinois frontier, wow. uh, when Illinois was the frontier rather than Kansas. And uh, he came up with this idea shortly after the Civil War of, and there had been other attempts to drive the cattle up from Texas mm -hmm. to uh, the railroad heads uh, that could ship them back to the stockyards back east. And uh, he just happened to show up in Abilene one day, actually headed to Salina, and because the uh, porter at the uh, station lost his luggage, he ended up coming back from Salina to pick up his luggage and uh, met with some of the folks here in Abilene to uh, propose his idea and they accepted. You know, other than the losing luggage part of mm -hmm. the story, we still do a lot of that in economic development in Abilene. We try to find people who are moving to someplace else and stop here, and we try to influence them with the benefits of staying here. Mm -hmm. And that's still how the economic model works here. Um, you know, I always uh, think about what would we be without the Longhorns? Exactly. We don't know because right. that was how population and economic prosperity started here. That's right. And without a start, I'm not sure where you finished, Troy. <laughs> uh, probably a totally different story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it was certainly a big boom for Abilene for four years mm -hmm. from 1867 mm -hmm. through 71. And one of the artifacts we're going to be showing in the exhibit we're doing on the 150th anniversary is Joseph McCoy's sketchbook that was published oh, that he wrote afterwards. Okay. And there's some wonderful early sketches of um, downtown <laughs> Abilene, uh, or certainly Abilene in the stockyards. Okay. okay, tell us a little bit about what you are going to do for the 150th celebration. When is the exhibit going to be mm -hmm. set up and how long is it gonna run? Uh, the exhibit opens on April 1st, uh, a date specifically chosen because all three states, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, are celebrating the 150th anniversary of the start of the Chisholm Trail. Mm -hmm. And April 1st was uh, the first load, or the day the first Heard, excuse me, okay, uh, were driven uh, hmm. up from Can uh, from Texas uh, to Kansas, and we'll be running through about this time next year, so April to April. Uh, okay, so it'll be up well, for that, a year, so plenty terrific. of time to come and see. That's true. And we are going to be borrowing some artifacts and bringing things in, so the artifacts will be changing while the exhibits are up. You know what a what a great thing again is that we have the resources in our community to do things like that because of Dwight David Eisenhower 
and the things that are here. Mm -hmm. So we're, he's not the only source of artifacts about the Chisholm Trail, That's but right. certainly a significant contributor to what has been saved. Mm -hmm. It was exactly. Dwight David Eisenhower's library and museum. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting, I think, historic facts is that we're actually, where the campus is now, we're sitting on one of the cattle pens uh, that were, or at least a portion of it. And uh, before this was a neighborhood where the Eisenhower boys grew up, um, there was actually a blacksmith shop, and that's what these black and white photographs are. Uh, they did some historic archaeology here in the early 1970s, and they uncovered the foundation of a blacksmith shop dating from the time of the Chisholm Trail. So we have all kinds of connections. Abilene has a, has a lot of things to say about ourselves in the Chisholm Trail. I have, I have talking to my wife who runs Great Plains Theater and, and that where the site of the old Alco headquarters building is, is again one of those cattle pen mm -hmm. end of the trail locations That's right. uh, historically. And you know, I, I, I think this about history. I love history because it's interesting. I love history in books and I even love Louis L'Amour books like you have right over <laughs> Good there. Choice. I love custom Colts <laughs> real well and I like big horns, but what I like even better is when his, history has provided us an opportunity to continually prosper forward. That's a great way to uh, So, you know, I'm glad that the old Alco building is a site where the Chisholm Trail cattle pens once stood. Mm -hmm. I'm even happier that there is a firm called Thunderstruck Bumpers and a, uh, a business called Great Plains Theater right. in that building still providing value to citizens that, and I'm sure Dwight David Eisenhower would be agreeing with me yeah, if he were here I today. I think he would. I think he would. So... Um, you mentioned uh, those marvelous items. Maybe oh Troy could tell us about those. Uh, these are a, a pair of Colt peacemakers. Want me to show them to him, Troy? <laughs> he does. Oh, what you, you've got your gloves Look on. Look there, yeah. he does. <laughs> these were given to Eisenhower by Annan Carter, who was the owner and head editor for the uh, Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And it's it's kind of remarkable about it on um, just how beautiful they are to begin with. One side that has the General long Dwight D. Eisenhower right. from Ammon Carter, 1945. Mm -hmm. On one side you have the Longhorn, right. and the other side the the plate. And the interesting thing about it was prior to the Chisholm Trail, there had been a trail that went north, but it went into Missouri, and it was called the Shawnee Trail. And Dallas was the big start. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go through Dallas, you load up on supplies, and you move on. Well, when the Chisholm Trail opened, Fort Worth became the, the last major post to go through before you entered uh, Indian Territory. And that is the birth of the feud between Fort Worth and Dallas, because Dallas lost all that business to Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And Annan Carter was a big proponent of that feud as well, even into the 1940s and 1950s. Just so the folks at home know, both of those pistols have been fired. Every cylinder shows burn marks from, from you, so we don't know whether it was President Eisenhower, mm -hmm. but they were gifted to him, right? So That's right. I'll bet they hadn't been fired before they were gifted to him. What do you I, think? I wouldn't think so. I think they would have been brand new yeah. gifts to yeah. uh, General Eisenhower in 1945. Yeah. So. So. Very cool, Charles. Yeah, you get a gold star for oh, thank you. that. <laughs> okay, um, the photographs. You, you I kind of took you off topic, but That's you know, okay. the the excavation was done where the parking lot has been extended in, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And there was an old blacksmith shop underneath there. Mm -hmm. Again, a, our point about the layers of history that are centered around Dwight David Eisenhower at his boyhood home and who he is. And uh, we're still trading in that, that value today. That's right. And I think uh, it's interesting that you know Ike, Ike's backyard had a blacksmith shop, even though they didn't know it. Mm -hmm. uh, but across the street from him lived one of Wild Bill Hickok's deputies. So as a young boy, he heard all the stories from a firsthand uh, person who had participated in the wild Texas street days of Abilene. Yeah. The painting that we have oh. of Eisenhower on a horse, tell uh, us about that. That is a really wonderful artifact. It was commissioned by uh, the Newark, New Jersey um, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars. Okay. And they gave it to Ike in 1968, uh, one year before he passed away. 
And uh, even then, of course, Ike's a love of all things Western uh, were well known. And uh, he was uh, supposedly got quite a chuckle out of that when he was uh, given it, because uh, he actually received it when he was in the hospital in Walter Reed. So I'm going to ma make an editorial comment here. Mm -hmm. All right, and you're going to help me. If I if I if I <laughs> impale myself on the horns, you're going to save me. Okay, okay? I'll, I'll try. So. In a previous conversation today, Tim Reeves said that Eisenhower loved Bonanza as mm -hmm. a program. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that f <laughs> painting, who that is other than Eisenhower's head? Reminds you a little bit of? Not only is it uh, Mr. Cartwright, it's his horse, mm -hmm. which is what I pick. It's the scene. It's yes. the photograph where he stops the horse. It's very close to the it. Beginning. Interestingly I, enough, awfully close to that. Too, we uh, in our files on the painting, we actually have, and unfortunately, I have forgotten the product, um, but it's some kitchen product like soap or washing detergent or something, and uh, the horse is in that pose. Is that right? Um, you know, wow. there's actually no rider on the horse, but the horse is in that pose, yeah. and it's exactly the same yeah. pose. So, very yeah. popular image of the times. Okay, very well, good. I didn't hurt myself too bad then. No, not all that right. at all. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about these horns again. Uh, and I drove from, uh, my wife and I drove to South Padre Island to visit a couple friends and get dip our toes in the ocean for several days last week or week, Very nice. two weeks ago. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's a long way down there. <laughs> yes, And it we is. were in a Dodge Charger going about 75 to 85 miles an hour the Didn't whole way, that. right? <laughs> so we were not on that horse following mm -hmm. this cow. Nor did we have to, as you alluded to, gather these cattle out of that miserable mesquite country. Mm -hmm. that, is, that had to be an incredible, incredible task and that, that I don't know that we can really properly appreciate today, but I sure wanted mm -hmm. to talk about it. Well, not including the roundup time, it would be a minimum of two months, depending on where they left in Texas, to get to Abilene. They averaged about 10 to 15 miles a day, de mm -hmm. depending on the weather. Uh, when they first got the herds together, they would have to have half of their cowboys, which usually they would run about 10 cowboys or, or drovers for each drive. They would have half of them up all night circling the herd and make sure they were all tight. By about a week into the drive, the cattle were used to it enough that they could cut back to one or two guys at night and then they would rotate their, their shifts on who was up at night doing this. But it was hard, dusty work. There, there is no doubt about it that that was a rough life. You know, interestingly enough, as a great example of um, of the economy of this thing, I guess I'd, I'd like to comment to that. You know, we often think about uh, maybe your job or his job or Sam's job or Dave's job or my job. We think about that not as the person who does it. We think about what we see from the outside, right. and. Everybody, close friends, you, you go, well, yeah, how would you like to do what I do for a day? <laughs> the fellows who rounded these cattle up, this mm -hmm. huge prosperity that came to Abilene was started by people who were starving to death in Texas, and it was the mm -hmm. only commodity left that you could turn into cash, it was wild cattle in yes. even wilder country. That was not an easy day. No, definitely not. And I, what I think is kind of fascinating, too, is even though there were only just a few, really, cowboys on any given drive, there was a very definite pecking order as to where you rode in the herd and how high up you were. And, of course, you know, you didn't necessarily want to be the guy behind the Ride herd. and drag. You didn't want to be <laughs> ride and drag. Being a roper, mm -hmm. I walked in this morning, I looked at these horns, and I go, holy mackerel. Well, I've never roped anything that wide. I've roped something about this wide, I guess, and that was that was a task. But um, the, it was a whole different set of tools to rope these kind of mm -hmm. cattle. They braided rawhide lariats, and, right. and most of that came from the Mexicans, uh, and passed those skills to the Texans. Correct. But they, they were a very small diameter, maybe about the size of your little finger, mm -hmm. and they were they're woven very tightly, and right. they, they carried a minimum 60 feet of that and sometimes 120. Modern rope, 30 to 35 feet. Mm -hmm. So think about that. You got 120 feet of rope in your hand. How wide is that, Troy? 
That that one's a little over six feet. Okay, so yeah. Which would have been a yeah. That's probably more like seven and a half feet yeah. closing in on eight. So you know you have sixteen foot of loop mm -hmm. in the yeah. air to get around the horns. Mm -hmm. that, that's a lot of swing, and then mm -hmm. you look back at the miserable mesquite country. Those yeah. trees they grow like this. I mean they they shade the ground. They so mm -hmm. I. I made the comment to Elizabeth, I go, how would you ever swing a rope in that country? They evidently did. Mm -hmm. they, and they got very good at it. And there's actually, they learn all these different kind of the backhand throw. The, and right. it, it, it's fascinating to actually sit there and, and read some of the stuff on how they develop because you never, the Cowboys never took time to write this stuff down. Mm -hmm. So in the 1920s and 30s, you start having guys talking to the old cowboys about well how did you learn this and you you had to learn it and you had to learn it fast and uh, just different kind of throws for where the cattle were and what kind of countryside you were in and, and all sorts of other methods yeah. uh, that weren't a horse and a rope you know I mean the bolos uh, we learned to rope the industry I guess learned to rope feet before you rope horns sometimes because you you take something like this by the horns you still got quite a problem on your hands <laughs> yeah. yes, you because he's got four legs under him yeah. and he might not be happy you just roped him so all of those things uh, um, I grew up in southwest Colorado and that little area of Colorado wasn't really developed until the 1900s there mm -hmm. wasn't much mm -hmm. there I right. mean there were a few mines up in the mountains but that is about it so the real population came in there between 1900 and 1925 or so to farm and break mm -hmm. ground and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But one of my great uncles, he came to that country, he rode in with a horse and uh, three bulldogs. bulldogs. Guess what he was doing, Troy? He was capturing wild cattle mm -hmm. th that were the there. And uh, you know nice. what he basically did, the dogs would catch them and then he would rope them, tie them up until they were a little easier to deal with and mm -hmm. then gather them up. But again, that is, that's hard work for hard times. Definitely, very much so. But Abilene prospered yes. for those four years. What's the most exciting thing, I think, as, as we think about Dwight David Eisenhower and General Eisenhower, we, we, just, we, we film a lot of things about who he is. Mm -hmm. But as we sit here today and our community is looking at the 150th anniversary as a real shot in the arm economically to get people here, mm -hmm. what's the most exciting thing we think we can say about Eisenhower's importance to that? Oh, wow. That is a good question. It is um, a good question. Well, when when he answer. built, when he when he decided on Abilene to be the location for the presidential library, he did he gave a pretty good speech on it, and he basically said, "This is going to draw people to Abilene. It's going to draw people from around the world to Abilene to come and study about the presidency. But at the same time, it's also to learn and study about the people of Abilene and the town itself." It's going to be an ec economic boon for the town, but it's and it's going to be able to put its history on the forefront. And even when he was thinking of building this library, he was thinking about the town of Abilene and what, how good it would be for the town of Abilene. Wow, very well said. I totally agree. And we're still getting researchers from all over the world coming here, so as well as visitors to the museum. So he was absolutely right. So you know, that's a great way to end the program of why like I, uh, uh, um, Eisenhower was truly in every way a man of great vision. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting? His vision extended to prospering Abilene where he grew up, that he would give what he gave of what was left of his of his of the history of his life That's right. as a jump start to that and and look at all the benefits and how far it has extended yes. off this table yeah. folks you're going to get a chance to see these longhorns in Abilene again this summer and fall this Labor Day time frame I do believe it's it'd be all over the internet so you can find it but when you're out there looking at that uh, remember our favorite son, Dwight David Eisenhower, and stop by the library, the museum, and spend a half a day here. You'll never regret that decision. William Snyder, Troy Elkins, Dennis Weiss, I work for Eagle Communications, wishing you a terrific day. <laughs>